Um, when I got that lovely call Sunday night that our speaker could not come today because of uh, some other things he has going on, he actually has a conference or uh, a seminar series that he's giving in another week and he was not nearly as far with that as he thought he would be, so he's like, I really need time to prepare. And um, I was kind of like, well, sure, I, I can do it, no problem. I'm not sure what I'll speak on, but uh, again, it, it seems like when I'm asked to give a message, Oftentimes, it's something that God wants to convict me of. And I hope that it's also a blessing or something that touches our church family as well. But oftentimes, um, by spending time studying something, by putting the uh, research and things in, you get a lot of things out of it that God wants for you. So um, I believe that this message is something he put on my heart, not just for the congregation, but really for myself. So. Um, I pray that he can use it, and it will be a blessing to everybody here. I will be starting by reading from the book uh, Revelation, the ch third chapter, and I'm going to read over verses 14 through 22. And um, most of us know that Pastor David is doing a series on the churches of Revelation. Um, I told him, I said, I'm going to be speaking on... Uh, modern day Laodicea, I said, but I don't think it's going to be a message like you've been presenting, so I said you should be able to still, in another couple months, give your uh, message on the Church of Laodicea, and they shouldn't overlap or anything. So, um, I know he will be speaking of this in the future, but this should be a totally different course than what he's taking, I think. Uh, Revelation 13, I'm sorry, Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22. And the subtitle is The Lukewarm Church. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye self, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. I'm just going to say a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for being such a gracious God who gives us these messages to touch our hearts and to wake us up out of this sleep that we're in. I just pray that today your name is glorified and the words that I speak are the words that you have put on my heart and that you work through the Holy Spirit in me. Um, on my own I can do nothing, but I am thankful and grateful that you do use me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So looking at today's church, um, now more than ever, we resemble the church of Laodicea. We are very comfortable, we are very lukewarm. According to worldly standards, we pretty much lack nothing, not just as a church, but as a country. We are very well-to-do, so they would say. God's observance of the situation is a little bit different, though. He realizes how broke we are. Some could say we're about as spiritually, spiritually broke as this nation is, but we do not even realize it. As a denomination, we're growing. We have further reaching ministries than we have ever had before. We cover more territory than at any point in time. We have generous donors, but the work is without the full power of the Holy Spirit in its full capacity. We're doing it mostly through human effort. Imagine how rapidly the church would grow and the word would spread if 
that word and the work had the full power of the Holy Spirit, also known as the latter rain, behind it. How much longer can things on this earth continue? My answer to that is a little bit controversial, but I say as long as we allow it to. As long as we're comfortable in this lukewarm state, things will continue to go on how they have been going on for a long, long time. There was somebody that Ellen White corresponded with quite a bit. Uh, last name is Haskell, and he gave his take or his summary on uh, many of the comments, many of the thoughts that Ellen White had written to him um, over the years that she had sent him letters. And that quote is, God designed to close the work just in proportion as his people felt the importance and sacredness of the work and the zeal with, with which they took a hold of it. So how zealous are we to do God's work and live a Christ-like life? How zealous was the early church in the time of the apostles to spread this work? They were pretty zealous, weren't they? And what happened with that work? What were the results? They were something like we've never seen before, but something that we're told we will see again in the last days. We will have that Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we will turn this world upside down to the power of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, we, as a church, want to give enough to feel like we're contributing, but fear true surrender and true reformation. Oftentimes, I hear it stated that we are waiting on God. We ask, how much longer? We ask, why hasn't he come yet? Like Adam and Eve in the garden, we point the finger at God rather than taking a long, sobering look in the mirror and realizing it's the one staring back at us that has caused this delay. And I say there again, we as part of this body, as a cumulative number. No individual is the sole blame. The higher the position, the more accountable we are held and the more guilt we bear. Some of you may ask, how can I say such a thing? Don't I believe in God's perfect timing? I absolutely do believe in God's perfect timing. He 100% knows the day and the hour that his church will wake up out of this lukewarm state and be prepared for his coming. He knows that that will be in five years, 50 years, or 500 years from now. He knows exactly when we will be ready, when we'll realize our current state, and come before him broken, ready to surrender and truly seek his help. And for some of us, I hope this doesn't happen anytime soon because I'd love to see you all here next Sabbath, but we could die in the next minute, next hour, and for us, the coming of Christ would be just like that. So it's very important not to try to set times on things and say, oh, his coming is so far off. It could be tomorrow. It could be this afternoon, so we must always be ready to meet God. We must understand something about the character of God and truly dwell on it. God wants us all to have the opportunity to repent and to surrender to him. God is not anxious to destroy us. He is, however, anxious to save us. That's why he sent Christ to suffer and die for our sins, but he won't force us to act in a way that we choose not to. And I've said it before at times, I wish he would. I wish he'd just flip that switch and I could be a perfect robot for God. But that's not the way that he wants us to operate. He wants us to be our free will. So praise God for that, even though the human in me says, you could make it a lot easier just by flipping a switch. But God doesn't want robotic love. When we consider the story of the children of Israel being taken out of Egypt and brought to the gates of the promised land but not being allowed to enter, what thoughts cross our minds? Most of us know and understand why they weren't allowed to enter. Does anybody have comments on why they weren't allowed to enter Egypt? They were afraid. They were afraid, they were stiff-necked, an idolatrous people, they were rebellious, and they were lacking their faith. The bottom line is they were afraid to leave their fate in someone else's hands. It's hard to put your trust in anyone, especially in this country, in the hands of anybody but ourselves. We want to control our own fate. We want to control our own destiny. But I ask you this, who wasn't ready? Was it God who wasn't ready to let them in? Or was it his people who weren't ready to enter? 
So for 40 years, they roamed the desert until they were ready. And even then, we see how quickly they backslid right after the great victory against the city of Jericho. And I'm going to read the story found in Joshua, the seventh chapter, verses 2 through 5. The beginning of the Bible, Joshua judges Ruth. So Joshua, chapter 7, verses 2 through 5. And the subtitle of my Bible is The Defeat at Ai. Joshua 7, 2 through 5. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. But let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up from there, from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about thirty-six men, for they chased them from before the gate, as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people were melted and became like water. So the spies, you go from their first trip to Canaan where they're like, no matter what happens, we cannot overcome. God led them to the desert, changed their hearts, changed their mindsets. They had faith. They marched around the city of Jericho and they did this miraculous thing, but it wasn't them who did it. It was God, what he did for them. But they quickly forgot that. The report to Joshua, instead of saying, the victory is the Lord's, send however many people the Lord says to send, and we will do his will, they looked at the numbers and thought, we can do it. Only send a small number. Don't weary the people. We've got this. They're so tiny. Our military might can take them out. Look at us. This can also be paralleled when we look at our good works or our own righteousness. I'm going to read a quote here uh, from Ellen White. I apologize, I did not write down the source. If you want the source, I'm sure I can send me an email. My email's on the front of the bulletin. I will find the exact source. Usually I uh, write the source down, but for some reason I didn't with this one. But it's a good quote nonetheless. The sinner cannot depend on his own good works as a means of justification. He must come to the point where he will renounce all his sin and embrace one degree of light after another as it shines upon his pathway. He simply grasps by faith the free and ample provision made in the blood of Christ. He believes the promises of God, which through Christ are made unto him sanctification and righteousness and redemption. And if he follows Jesus, he will walk humbly in the light, rejoicing in the light, and diffusing that light to others. Being justified by faith, he carries cheerfulness with him in his obedience in all his life. Peace with God is a result of what Christ can, is to him. The souls who are in subordination to God, who honor him, and are doers of his word, will receive divine enlightenment. In the precious word of God, there is purity and loftiness as well as beauty that, unless assisted by God, the highest powers of man cannot attain to. Today, if we're honest with ourselves and ask the question, is God not ready to return? Or are we, as his people, not ready for his return? What would your answer be? As much as it hurts to be stuck here, we can't begin to imagine how much more it hurts God and the hosts of heaven. I heard a minister make this statement recently, and um, I happen to agree with him, so I'm including it. When Christ returns, the church here on earth will reflect the church of Philadelphia, not the church of Laodicea. I'm gonna have us turn back to Revelation, the third chapter over what I just kind of read. And I'm going to look at a few verses um, because this is actually a message to 
the Church of Philadelphia. We're just going to look at some of the characteristics that church had and what we can look forward to. So I'll be reading from Revelation, the third chapter, verses 8, verses 10, and 12. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Verse 10. Because you have kept my command to preserve, persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And then verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. So some of the characteristics of the Church of Philadelphia, the church I believe that we will more closely resemble when Christ returns, we will have the love of Christ in us. We will have the faith of Jesus. We will keep his commandments with joy. We will be of one accord for his work, and we will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So some of you with the message so far might be thinking, you know, nice job, way to bring this down. We came here to get a, a message that is really exciting and uplifting and can just, you know, make us feel great. And while there are some sobering aspects of it, and if I ended the sermon there, things might not be so uh, positive, but we will not end things on that note. First off, I want to point out, I am not saying Jesus can't come soon. He knows his perfect timing for us. I do not. There is also good news. God wants as many as possible to be saved. He wants to return to a church prepared to meet him, prepared to be translated without seeing death. Because of that, he won't return for a Laodicean church. If he did, it would spell disaster for us. Instead, he's waiting for us to realize we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He's waiting for us to come to him in prayer, admitting that we see our current condition and we truly, honestly, 100% in our hearts do not like what we see. We must also wholeheartedly pray the prayer that Daniel prayed in Daniel chapter 9, verses 3 through 11, and then verses 18 and 19. And I'm going to read that prayer where Daniel, a man at that was just, in, in my opinion, just amazing. The things that he went through, the pillar that he was for God, the prayer that he didn't say, you know, be with these others. He included himself in this prayer. So I'll be reading not the whole prayer, because it's a little bit long, but I will read Daniel chapter 9, verses 3 to 11, and then verses 18 and 19. And verse 3 starts, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us, shame of face, as it is to this, as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those near and those far off, and all the countries to which you have driven them, because the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed his voice of the Lord our God, to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, 
the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Then verse 18, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. We must acknowledge not only our sins, but the sins of this body as a whole, from the bottom to the top. And this isn't to be done judgmentally. It's not supposed to be like the prayer of the Pharisee where it's like, I thank God that I'm not like this person. It's supposed to be true, heartfelt repentance. Acknowledging and seeing the errors that have been made and truly being sorry for them. And by the grace of God, repent. And most importantly, do not repeat the same errors that we have made. We will be taken over this ground time and time again until we are not repeating the same errors over and over. God's waiting for us to cry out saying, Lord, I am all these things and as much as I've tried, I can't change them. That's where righteousness by faith comes in. Justification comes through the blood of Christ. Sanctification comes through the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit. Righteousness by faith isn't to be a theory, rather an experience that changes the heart. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 tells us, the just shall live by his faith. We must realize our condition and confess it. We must come to the realization that even the best of what we can produce is nothing but a filthy garment. We need to understand that on our own, we can do nothing. But we aren't just to give up and throw up our hands and say, that's right, we, we can't do anything. We mustn't only claim the promises of Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We must surrender and allow him to transform us. Our salvation doesn't just end with justification. There is very much focus on justification, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because justification is a very important step of the, profit, the process. But I still hear too many proclaiming that we will just be in this sinful body. We're going to keep sinning and sinning and sinning until the day that Christ appears in the clouds to take us home, which, if you consider things, would also be disastrous for us. I could probably make a mini sermon in this next little section here, but I will do what I can to keep it short. Um, I'm just going to ask some questions, have some reflection thoughts a little bit. Um, where is Christ right now? What is he doing for us? He's interceding for our sins, right? He will judge the dead, and then he will move on to judge the living. And um, that right now has him pretty busy, but... Will this work end before he comes? He's not going to be coming to this earth and continually ministering his blood in the sanctuary. There is a point where he will stand up and take his priestly garments off and replace them with kingly garments and come for his people. Once that happens, he's no longer mediating. So judgment ends, God's people are sealed, they will no longer sin, and then the plagues fall on the earth. Can those with sins unconfessed or unatoned for stand in the presence of a holy God without horrible consequences? If he could, all of us could see him right now face to face. He could come, but as we know, man cannot see him face to face. The closest that we've come is seeing Christ in the flesh, human flesh. Moses got to see the back of Christ. And even with that, when you look at the time that Moses spent up in that mountain, when he came down, his face radiated so much that glory of God, the Israelites in their sin were so terrified to look on it, they said, cover your face with a veil 
we're, we're terrified to see you. So just that little glimpse, if Israel was terrified just at the reflection of light shining off of Moses, imagine standing in the presence of a holy God with sin in us. We are first justified, then we are sanctified through surrender and the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Then we are transformed when we are freed from these broken bodies at his second coming, and then comes glorification. So, getting close to closing here, this was again something that um, weighed very heavily on me, but there are some questions that I have asked myself, and right now I'm asking myself again. Um, anything I say here, as Steve Oss used to say, there's one finger pointing there, mm -hmm. technically three pointing at me, and then my thumb is at Tim Noel or Lucy. I'm not <laughs> sure which one gets uh, the brunt of it today, but there's only one pointing out there, but three of them are pointing back at me, so I think this applies to me more than anything. I hope that we focus on this prayerfully reflecting on the last part of Revelation chapter 3 verse 19 where it says, therefore be zealous and repent. First of all, what am I afraid of? We had seen a uh, sermon last Sabbath, I think it was by Pastor Doug, and it was entitled, You Are What You Eat. And he had kind of made the point that, you know, oftentimes in society, we spend so much time on secular, worldly entertainment, so much time in the world, we're afraid of just about everything. I mean, when you really consider it, and he made the point, you know, and again, not to, this is not his whole sermon, but pretty much the gist of it is, if I'm afraid, is telling me that I'm spending too much time in the world and not enough time in the Word. God will bring us through the time of trouble, and this little time that we're in, this is nothing compared to what we are going to experience if we are still alive at that time. So it is our opportunity to put our time in the Word and really get a closer walk with God. Another thing that I have been asking myself and ask myself, am I willing to admit that I am wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Am I willing to admit I've tried so many times to do it on my own and I failed miserably? God already knows the times that I failed more than I can count, but he knows every time, but he doesn't hold that against me. He is willing to help every time I ask for that help. Amen. As long as I'm willing to surrender. That's all he asks. All we have to say is, God, I can't do it, but I know I want to change. I know I want your spirit to transform my life. I am willing to surrender. Please work in me this great promise that you have made. And he'll do it. Amen. The other question I have to ask myself is, do I really believe that? Is this just words? Are these just words that I'm reading over and say, yeah, yeah, God, this is it. I'm claiming this promise doesn't mean anything to me. Revelation 3.20 tells us, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Will you open your heart to him? He's patiently waiting for his people to be ready so he can take us away to a place that is beyond anything we could ever imagine. Revelation 3.21 tells us to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. By his grace, through zealous, heartfelt confession and repentance, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can and we will overcome. Then we will finally turn from this lukewarm Laodicean state, and Christ will come in his glory to take us away from this place. With that thought, we will have our closing hymn, which is hymn number 633, singing about when we all get to heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the hope that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the promise of your return. 
we all do look forward to the day that you will come back to send Jesus, to take us to heaven, so we can all rejoice and shout the victory, shout in your presence. It's not through our own works. It is all through you. It is all through Christ. It is all through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way we can overcome and have any hope. I just pray, Lord, that we don't get discouraged focusing on ourselves because we are weak. We are miserable. We are wretched. We are poor. We are blind. But you give us the richest blessing, the richest gift ever, and that is the gift of redemption through your Son, Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome, and your infinite love for us. I just pray that you bless us and help us to grow nearer to you and have that faith that will transform us from this Laodicean state. These things I ask in the Son of your in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated to be ushered out.